The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Broken Apocalypse puts off a rival as middle class complacency once again reigns on Evil's Parade. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have an interview with Susan R. Matthews on her omnibus collection of stories and novellas, Fleet Insurgent. This is the third volume in the complete reissue of Susan Matthews' Under Jurisdiction series that we're doing here at Bain. Volumes 1 and 2 had the first six novels in that series, and we put out new novel, Blood Enemies, this past spring, and it'll be out in mass market this summer. Plus, we have a follow-up to Blood Enemies, uh, a new Under Jurisdiction novel on tap, as as Susan will tell us about. Fleet Insurgent, which is out now, collects the rest of the Under Jurisdiction series, the short stories and novellas Susan has written in, in that universe. It's got some delightful stuff in it and some really uh, powerful stuff, and we'll talk with Susan about it in a moment. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of the Aiden Universe novel Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Now here's the news. Heads up, there's a great new e-arc out there now at Bain eBooks. Now, an e-arc is the path that Narwhal, the unicorn of the sea, takes through the magical ether when it makes its quantum leap to the land of fairy to recharge its horn with sexual potency magic. The return path, by the way, is called an e-carp. No, that's not true at all. An e-arc is an electronic advanced reading copy, which is an e-book version of a galley in a book series that um, you might really want to catch up on, and it comes out early. This one is about three and a half months early, as a matter of fact, that we're about to talk about, and it is full of typos. Uh, it's been copy edited, but not proofread, so you'll see some perhaps interesting anomalies and such, but uh, in general, you get the book that the author wrote, and you get it early. And available right now at Bain eBooks is Though Hell Should Bar the Way by David Drake. This is the new RCN novel. Honor in a world of pirates, politics, and spies. He's a rich kid who's lost everything. The money's gone. His family is in disgrace. Roy Opheltree planned to be an officer in the Republic of Cinnabar Navy. But when his father is unmasked as a white-collar criminal... Roy has to take whatever he can get and take it fast, which turns out to be an assignment to accompany Captain Daniel Leary and Lady Adele Monday as they go off to start a war that will put Roy at the sharp end. Roy Elfeltree doesn't know it yet, but he's actually been given the chance of a lifetime to serve under one of the best of the best. It's a chance to prove himself, not for what he has, but for who he is. The action doesn't slow, nor can Roy, for Captain Leary has given Roy a chance, and Roy is determined to make the most of it, though hell should bar the way. Though hell should bar the way, EARC is available only at Bain eBooks. Go there, get it, and ring in the new year with an acerbic adventure as David Drake Reed. I want to welcome Susan R. Matthews to the podcast. Hello, Susan. Nice to have you back. <laughs> Howdy. Susan R. Matthews was raised in a military family, spent her younger days living around the globe in a myriad of places, including Germany, both coasts of the U.S. and India, often cut off from television and other media. Oh, my God. She read voraciously. Her <laughs> first encounters with science fiction came via classics such as I, Robot and Stranger in a Strange Land. Matthews' debut novel, An Exchange of Hostages, was the first entry in her critically acclaimed under-jurisdiction series, and it was nominated for a Philip K. Dick Award. She was Susan, not Matthews, I'm reading this biography, uh, was also a finalist for the John W. Campbell Award, Campbell Award for Best New Writer. There are now seven novels, if I think that's right, including Blood Enemies in the under-jurisdiction series. The first six are collected in the two omnibus editions, Fleet Inquisitor, uh, and Fleet Renegade, both out from Bain last year, or late the year before. The The newest entry in the series is Blood Enemies, which was out last year from Bain Books and will be out as a mass market in the summer. 
Susan lives in Seattle with her wife, Maggie, and two delightful dogs. She is a veteran of the U.S. Army, where she served as operations and security officer of a combat support hospital. She is also an avid ham radio operator. Are you still into the ham, Susan? Absolutely. Cool. Hello, Foxtrot 7, Romeo Tango Foxtrot. Uh, That's my call sign. So now out at Booksellers is Fleet Insurgent, which is volume three in Bain Book's reissue and presentation of everything we can get our hands on in the Under Jurisdiction series by Susan R. Matthews. This one includes, I think, um, is it three new novellas or four new novellas? Two new ones and four uh, novellas, right? Yeah, uh, there, there are four novellas total. Uh, the first one that I wrote um, was when a lovely convention called Fog Con uh, for Friends of Genre Con in Walnut Creek, California, invited me one year to be a guest. Very small con, and I thought it would be fun to uh, to write a novella that would kind of hopefully suck in people that hadn't read a jurisdiction novel. So I wrote uh, that novella, Jurisdiction. It, it came out pretty meaty. I wrote that as a gateway drug that I hoped would lure people into my evil empire. Uh, so that was the first one. That was 2003, I think. Um, and after that, uh, I was pleased with the way that worked out, and it kind of pointed out to me that there was an opportunity uh, using short stories or novellas, uh, even vignettes sometimes possibly, to um, address lots of issues that were really important parts of the progression of the entire series, but that didn't fit into any particular novel, and that weren't themselves... um, that didn't themselves have a novel, uh, a novel weight or heft or kind of potential to be uh, as long and uh, and in depth as a as a uh, a novel ought to be, with beginning and middle and end, and the protagonist has a problem to solve, and so on and so forth. So once I figured that out, I've been having fun with it ever since. Yeah, and there's. In a way, this is, I mean, you have been working on this this series for a long time and most of your adult life, right? I mean, you started... That's correct. Back in the 70s, or... (laughs) Yeah, it did. Um, I I wrote, I was, yeah, I started to write the first Kosciuszko novel um, as I thought of it in those days. I was writing the first scenes of that novel in, like, December of 1978. Uh, So I wrote my first draft of my first novel in 1979, basically, and it was a mess, as you can imagine. Physically, it was a mess because it was typed on a uh, portable manual typewriter um, on the... uh, paper that's eight and a half by 14 inches and um, single spaced and uh, generally speaking uh, not much fun to look at and I was trying to get everything that I possibly knew about the entire story into one document at the time so it was half the length of a decent novel that had like eight times as much story as uh, as would otherwise make uh, four or five different novels. And in the course of time, as the series has developed, um, some of the elements in that first attempt in 1979 have, in fact, uh, turned out to be uh, two or three novels. And so it's been a long, long time. And the and we collected the, the six first novels, and we have put out the seventh, Blood Enemies, um, but these are these are the interstitial pieces, right? This is the 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 things that you have written to support the world. They're sort of a, um, a Silmarillion of sorts for the jurisdic- under jurisdiction series. Would you respectfully disagree or agree? Or what, what were your thoughts on that? <laughs> Uh, no, I think that that uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't compare it in uh, mythic import and uh, and weight and so on and so forth to the Sil- Silmarillion in any sense. But uh, 
to the extent that, yeah, it, it fills in pieces of background. It touches on things that might have been tangential in the course of a novel because they uh, couldn't be allowed to stop and fully explain and slow the action down and so on and so forth, uh, are in uh, the fleet insurgent um, omnibus. Yeah, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind it being described as a Silmarillion for the jurisdiction uh, uh, series. Sure. Well, it's pretty cool, whatever it is. Um, what is... Uh... Where did you get the idea for the whole series? How did it sort of come about that you started that that you had that info dump in 1978? Where were you? What were you thinking? Uh, not so much an uh, not so much an info dump as uh, it, it it started like a lot of things do start with uh, a single image um, that was even earlier than the 70s. Uh, and as a person does, one looks at a single image of a blonde man uh, sitting by himself in a darkened room, um, drinking a lot of gin and brooding. Uh, and then uh, you know, a person tries to make sense of what, what is that, what is that all about? And so I had been actually thinking about the concept of uh, uh, a professional torturer who had suddenly realized that what he was doing was an abomination under the canopy of heaven, um, and who had made his decision that uh, the way in which he was going to respond to his own guilt for his crimes was to hunt down and destroy everybody that was engaged in that enterprise. Um, and over the course of years, a person goes back to that uh, touches back on it time to time periodically to try and figure out more of the story. Um, I think the really critical piece of development, actually, in that story, as far as I'm concerned, was uh, that when I was thinking about it in the mid and late 70s, I was thinking about, gee, what about if you had somebody who had had his road to Damascus moment, his realization that it was morally wrong to torture people and like it, uh, and was not in a position to be able to leave the business, was not in a position to be able to stop. What is, what is a person going to deal with, do with themselves under those circumstances, uh, apart from cut their throats? Well, we're human beings, you know, we're kind of uh, psychologically predetermined not to cut our throats unless there is absolutely no other way. And so a reasonable and intelligent person, before they decide that there is only one way out and it's catastrophic, a reasonable person is going to start trying um, coping strategies, mechanisms. Well, maybe if I did this, it would be okay. Uh, no. All right. Uh, well, maybe if I did this, it would be okay. Um, no. So... Uh, as the series progressed, I like to think of it as the idea that in exchange of hostages, uh, my protagonist, Andre, he, he not so much decides what he, that um, uh, torturing people and liking it is wrong because he went into that novel believing that it was wrong to the extent that it happens under jurisdiction, where the punishment is grotesquely uh, out of proportion to the crime. So my in, in, the protagonist goes into the series in exchange of hostages, knowing it's wrong. His road to Damascus moment is his realization that not only is he actually rather good at it, but that he really, really, really enjoys it. That it is, in fact, um, a, a, a passionately arousing physical experience that is really tran. Sexual. It's a lot more to do with the pure joy of domination. And that is actually the protagonist's uh, road to Damascus moment in the Jurisdiction series. Andre realizing what he is capable of and why he's capable of doing it. So as the, course, as the series went on, uh, Andre spent the rest of the series trying to find the goddamn exit ramp, if you'll pardon my language. Um, trying one thing after another to figure out how he can continue to consider himself as a semi-decent human being with what he has in him, which he makes the conscious decision not to deny. Uh, 
not to embrace, but not to try and pretend that he is anything but what he has realized he is. Yeah. And and he tries coping strategies one after the other until he does come finally to the realization that there, if there's only one way out, then by golly, he'll take it. But uh, the story goes on. Yeah. And he's got, yeah, it goes on. And you've put him in this this vast star empire um, that's really original in conception in my and 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 touches on a lot of like like totalitarian archetypes for me when I was when I read it um, that it just uh, it's scary because it seems like it could happen to me <laughs> so much <laughs> the jurisdiction can you sort of describe the milieu that that he finds himself in it's an amalgamation of but and he he himself has this amazing past. Um, and he's part of a of a enormously wealthy clan, et cetera. Anyway, uh, tell us a, a short pricey of some of this depth of this thing. Um, my story takes place uh, in jurisdiction space. Um, as the story develops, we find out that there is um, a desperate alternative to jurisdiction space called Gone Beyond. But basically, uh, when the story begins, um, all of known space is under jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is a vast judicial uh, governing system um, that in earlier times uh, I encapsulated as what might happen if the Supreme Court of the United States took over the legislative and judi- and um, executive branches and then went slightly out of its mind. Um, it it um, contains strong, strong elements of uh, a, a thread of Chinese philosophical thought that I ran into uh, in my misspent youth. Uh, referred to as legalism. And there are a lot of elements to legalism. I'm not a scholar of Chinese philosophy, so I'm not really qualified to speak definitively of it. But there's two things that uh, I really liked of, of my limited understanding. And the first really important thing was that uh, if we make the punishment for lesser crimes sufficiently horrific that nobody will think of committing the greater ones. Uh, In Chinese history, for instance, and in Chinese imperial history, uh, at various times, uh, people who have rebelled against the the government uh, to a lesser extent, for instance, on the provincial level, when they're brought to justice, well, their family will be killed. Uh, the family of their parents will be killed. The family of their parents, brothers, and sisters will be killed, and so on and so forth. It's a pretty thorough erasure of your entire bloodline from the gene pool. When you get further on up, though, if that betrayal or resistance um, uh, is... Um, the responsibility are performed by or done by or undertaken by a member of the imperial family, uh, for instance, then the degree of which your relatives and your relatives' relatives and their relatives and so on and so forth will be exterminated, uh, reached in some instances astounding proportions. So if we make the punishment for uh, disobeying your husband, let's say, or disobeying your boss would be better. If your punishment for disobeying your boss is bad enough, then you're not going to be able to contemplate uh, disobeying the next level of government or the next level of government uh, after that, because the uh, results of a minor rebellion are horrific, and the results of a major rebellion are are catastrophic. Um, I really like that concept. Another concept that I ran into that I liked was the idea that if you bring a complaint to the law, um, you are as likely to suffer uh, physical uh, and uh, financial uh, pain as the person uh, that you're 
trying to bring to account. In other words, uh, the judicial system in some eras in China paid really close attention to giving everybody incentives not to involve the law at all, but to um, resolve a person's differences at a non-judicial level. Um, so there were a couple of different, different things about the Chinese legalists that I thought were really interesting. Yeah. Well, it feels like the, the, the babbling. You get you get um, if the jurisdiction. It feels like that. It's like if if you, it's like a machine, and even if you're trying to bring somebody to justice, you're liable to get caught in the gears and ground <laughs> around at least a little bit or destroyed in the sa- in some manner. Yes. And Andrea is is is. I mean, this is what he's up against. It's like this. This crazy, um, this this really oppressive um, and effective um, uh, system that you know that and he's the he's the point man for it, right? <laughs> yes, he is. And where he comes from, he comes from a rather parochial world called the Dolgaruki Combine. The uh, jurisdiction made first contact with the combine when the combine was in a military expansion phase. And when the jurisdiction encountered the Dolgoruki Combine, the jurisdiction, uh, it's been within the past several hundred years, the uh, jurisdiction was already big, big enough, certainly powerful enough, that uh, it was more than a military match for even a really aggressive, powerful uh, collection of world families that were really good at war. And so, sensibly... When they realized that they couldn't actually wage war anymore, they turned to economic warfare. But that's a, that's a different element. The point is that Andre comes from a culture which has as its single most overpowering, a powerful cultural value is actually filial piety, again, in the Chinese sense. So not only is the jurisdiction set up the way it is, but... Andre's own belief system is focused on doing uh, as his father tells him. That's the almost foundational value of the Dolgaruki Combine is that uh, uh, sons obey their fathers, uh, uh, citizens obey their governments, princes obey the autocrat, and the autocrat doesn't obey anybody until she runs into... uh, a jurisdiction. Uh, it, she is a is a innovation, by the way. The this is the first time in the history of the Dolgariki Combine that the autocrat has been female. It's one of the signs of social change within the combine over the course of the series. But the point to be drawn from, brought, drawn from that is not only is Andre's personal cultural background completely in line with this idea that the law is a tremendous monolithic uh, structure against which you must not uh, which you must not resist but Andre's personal value senses value system at the beginning of the series are that it is so unthinkable to uh, ultimately resist his father's wishes that not even the extremity of the injustice of the system in which he participates is enough to um, permit him, to enable him, for him to be able to contemplate not doing it. Yeah. In other words, a person builds a culture in which a person absolutely traps Andre Kosciuszko in order to see what he does next. Yeah, that was really mean of you, <laughs> but delightful for us. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, um and this the this world is so vast and it's old um it you know humans have been been it, there's not even a mention of earth in the series that I know of you know this is like way and there's there's been genetic engineering there's different like subspecies of humans and and such I'm not sure if they're even humans I don't know it, if it matters um they seem to be though right Susan I don't um, they're almost all of them uh, uh, human in, in the sense of being uh, bipedal and having 
uh, one heart, for instance, most of them only have one heart, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there has been really significant genetic drift. Uh, one of the important plot points is, for instance, that uh, a character who I love dearly is a uh, hill country new rail. Yeah, he's got the he's got quite an arm. <laughs> yeah, he's got a he's got a little extra biomechanical process in his shoulder that functions uh, in in my imagination a little bit like the throwing stick, the atl atl I think it is. Yeah. That um, you can use to throw a javelin that much further, faster, harder. Um, so there's been quite a bit of ge- of. Uh, Genetic drift, but I, I believe, as far as I know, at this point, all of those hominid sump species can still produce fertile offspring. Mm-hmm. It means that, as, as I conceive it, genetically, there may be some instances where there's been too much genetic drift, but more or less, more or less, everybody can still have fertile offspring with each other. Yeah. That's my thought. Yeah. And it's just, uh, I mean, it's, it Don't just mention- feels like people have been settled in on these, you know, that the, this has been around for thousands of years, um, people in, and that this is perhaps, you know, the third or fourth course of, uh, of an empire. I don't know if that's, uh, but that's very the, much so. Yeah. And to an extent, one of the reasons there's no mention of an earth is that of course, each one of those planets or world families or, uh, multi-world cons- world consortia like the Goldberg Combine. Each each and every one of those people believes that they are Earth. Um, there is one. Uh, there's only one thing I know about that really, and that is that uh, they're um, in Supicor Judiciary. Um, you have the oldest, most burnt out, used up worlds. Um, practically under jurisdiction. And so um, I think there's, there are vague suggestions that Supercore Judiciary may have been a uh, system of origin for the jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. I, I, make that, I make that supposition just because there are places in Supercore that are so thoroughly used up. But it has genuinely been so long that nobody really knows, although the jurisdiction has the resources to figure that out exactly. And to a significant extent, that question just isn't really important for worlds under jurisdiction. Where did we all come from? Um, In the same sense in which uh, one reads with interest the archaeology uh, of antiquity and the origin of our species as being in Africa, um, but uh, that doesn't inspire in me uh, a passion to return to my roots in Africa because it's been a long time since my uh, matrilineal DNA left Africa. That's kind of, kind of maybe uh, that situation where somebody could have found a system of origin and maybe somebody has, and it just really doesn't have a whole lot to do with people's lives under jurisdiction. Yeah. Every system believes that they are Earth. Yeah, it's just it's just cool that it's so 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 old that this can be the case. Then the and the the traditions and such, like Andre's um, um, matrilin- uh, patrilineal, uh, th- you know, these are ancient as well, just within the. So let's well, let's talk about the um, just to begin uh, the first short story in the in the piece and. That also introduces the idea of the malcontent, which is um, which is kind of central to, sort of subplot to the entire series as well. Um, and this is like this is when uh, Andre and his cousin uh, really sort of part ways as far as as um, where their life paths are taking them, right? Or death paths in the case of Stosi. True, <laughs> yeah. death paths. Yeah, um, you know, it was kind of it's kind of playing with the concept of alrighty. Um, uh, in the context of the series, uh, everybody that belongs to the religious order of St. Andre Malcontent is legally not a person at all. Uh, under jurisdiction, slavery is by and large illegal. Uh, the jurisdiction has made an exception for itself, a bond and voluntary security person, uh, is functionally a slave. 
and, and that's this is a huge part bind. of the series is the bond of voluntaries. So yes. Yeah. And uh, the Dol- in the Dolgruki Combine, jurisdiction has granted a religious exception. It's called for the uh, people who have elected the religious order of Saint Andre and Alcindent to be actually in law slaves which provides them with an awful lot of um, freedoms to move, shoot, and communicate uh, with, uh, with impunity, with relative impunity. Because if you have a problem with what one of the agents of the malcontent has done, you've got to go and accuse the saint himself, uh, because that malcontent is a non-person. That malcontent is merely a slave. Uh, and so if you have a problem with what that person has done, that slave has done, you've got to go talk to uh, to the, the person or entity that owns that slave, and that person or entity is St. Andre Malcontent, uh, who was martyred some, oh gosh, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of years ago. And, and so uh, any legal undertakings against the saint um, are going to drag out until the end of creation. So this is one way in which being um, a malcontent uh, provides a person with a measure of uh, freedom if a person is involved with the branch of the malcontent that is the secret service of the Dolgaruki Church. But class is bound to show up even in the process of giving yourself away to the malcontent at the levels of the aristocracy in which Andre uh, is placed, there's got to be like a formal funeral. Uh, there's got to be a lot of ritual around the idea that since this person, uh, Cousin Stanosh in the context of the series, this person has elected the malcontent, this person is no longer a person, how do we note the change in status from a a person uh, located within the aristocracy himself and a person who is just suddenly not there anymore. Uh, So uh, when Stashi elects the malcontents, you've got to have big church services, you've got to have smells and bells, if you'll pardon the phrase, Um, you've got to have uh, the funeral feast and, and the whole thing. But when in Angel of Destruction... Uh, the first, the fourth novel in the series, I think, and uh, a, a novel that is in um, Fleet Renegade, I think. Uh, in that novel, when a person from the underclass, the bottom level of social organization of the Dolgaruki Combine, when um, Kasmer Daigle uh, considers electing the malcontent, all he has to do is find a malcontent and... Uh, and agree to the bargain uh, that's made, and the malcontent puts the symbol of your slavery around your neck. It's a uh, it's a piece of red ribbon that's called the malcontent's halter, uh, and and that's basically it. So part of the fun for me with that particular thing was the difference between what happens when somebody at the upper levels of society looks malcontent versus what people will see when they look at Angel of Destruction about how exactly the same process ha- takes place if you're a slum kid. Yeah. Well, this is, I mean, you're obviously reflecting or, or um, drawing on the ideas of, of convents and monastery, monastic orders and things like that, that, because the rich people still sort of stay the rich guys and the rich women, <laughs> even though they're allegedly all equal within the order, right? Yes. Are they? And it, to a certain extent, once you get into the malcontent, it's leveled. It's yeah. a leveled playing field. Stashi uh, is useful to the malcontent when it comes to um, interacting with uh, certain levels of society because he walks the walk and talks the talk. Yeah. But, he's a, and he's just a very, you know, throughout the series, he's an extremely effective secret agent. Um, but the reason he's going in is because he's gay, right? I mean, that's the. Yes. And that's what the malcontent is for, is for um, people who have so-called deviant uh, sexual, uh, not impulses, but actual, like, you know, they're born that way, kind of. Uh, 
Yeah. And it's not just being homosexual, but it could be uh, other things as well, right? It's just if you're an outcast in society that can't find your way, that might be your, your place. That's correct. Um, there are some other malcontent agents that a person runs into in the course of the series. Uh, one of them, uh, Cousin Waklov in uh, Blood Enemies, is, uh, I'm sorry, I hope that wasn't a spoiler, is uh, a superlative pastry chef or, and cook. He, can, he is um, he's just a, a really good cook. And I have no idea why he elected the malcontent. I don't know if he ate his children <laughs> or, or what. Yeah, maybe he has appetites beyond <laughs> pastries. So I don't. That could it, be. It's but the the malcontent allows them to satisfy to at a certain extent. They're although under under the board, right? They're um, you know allows them to be themselves. In other words. Yeah. The basic bargain that you make with the saint is the saint gives you what you need to reconcile yourself with who you are and what you're doing here. And in return, you give everything to the malcontent, including uh, your your legal person. Um, so, for instance, for Stashi, uh, Stashi's issue is one... He's gay, and he's been gay since the day he was born. And two, he made up his mind fairly early on that he wasn't going to lie about it. It's possible to operate within Dolk Ruki society as a gay man and, um, and, and function as a respected member of society just so long as you have absolutely no gay behaviors. You never have sex with a man. You can want to have sex with a man all you want. Uh, you can go off planet to a service house and have sexual relations with men and then come home and perform the appropriate penance and so forth. Uh, Stashi is as stubborn as other people in his family and simply declined uh, to pretend that he was somebody other than how the Holy Mother made him. Yeah, and he is Andrea's best friend growing up. Uh, and they're cousins, it, and they're, they're friends because they're of similar temperament. They're both go getters. They're doers. Um, <laughs> yeah. And smart guys. And they were about the same age. Yeah. They were about the same age. They were raised uh, from childhood together, and so on and so, uh, so, so and forth. And Stussy so, yeah. is not in love uh, with, uh, with Andre. <laughs> either he's he's got his own, and they remain um, friends even though Stussy's officially dead to the world. And but he, both of them are pledged to different things that sometimes come in conflict with this. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So well, let's talk about the the first novella in the uh, in Fleet Insurgent, um, which is the one I'm trying to think of the name of where he goes to Yarkush Station and in the little mystery ensues. Yeah, that's that's a proving cruise. That's his first Andre's first. Uh, First away assignment on Scylla it happens quite quite quickly after the end of the first novel, An Exchange of Hostages. Uh, he and uh, the two bond involuntaries that have come with him uh, from Fleet Orientation Station Medical, in which Exchange of Hostages was set, um, have only been on board Scylla uh, for a small number of months. Um, and so... Uh, Robert St. Clair and Jocelyn Curran, uh, whom we met in the first novel, uh, are feeling their way within the uh, community of bond and voluntaries that's already there. Uh, and Andre is trying to adjust uh, to his anomalous position on Port Silla, uh, and really hoping that the first time his captain cannot uh, avoid invoking his judicial function, that maybe what happened to him and the exchange of hostages won't happen again, in the sense that's like uh, Andre's attempted accommodation number one. Well, you know, maybe I'll just uh, do it completely on drug assist and, 
and I won't uh, have to deal with my own uh, physical and emotional and passionate and psychological involvement in the entire process of torturing people. And, and it doesn't work. Uh, so, Proven Cruise uh, was interesting to me because it's like the beginning of Andre's official career, and also because, uh, spoiler alert, Jocelyn isn't dead. And I was quite fond of Jocelyn, and he has a very close relationship with Andre for the remainder of the entire series, um, even in retrospect, uh, since he's not alive for most of it. Yeah, and Andre is, I mean, he's a reminder of many things, and, and, and Andre carries his knives, which is sort of his soul. Uh, yes. Of his, around. Uh, so, um, this would be a probably a good time to talk about the because the bond, bond and voluntaries are getting used to Andre here as well and working in a in in normal conditions. We've seen them in the training period where um, where I think there was a lot with uh, Robert and Andre and uh, and Jocelyn, right? And we found out things about Robert and oh, it was just horrible. Some of the things that Andre had to do. <laughs> But this is more like, all right, now we're out on the spaceships, um, and and I've got this gang, this this group of men who are slaves, who are mental slaves. They're not just slaves. They're just like they could just explain what a bond and the kind of uh, what it's like to be a bond and voluntary and about the day and all that. Oh, it's tremendous fun to be a bond and voluntary. Um, the uh, requirement for bond and voluntary goes hand in hand with the fact that the entire system of inquisition of judicial torture um, is a is a developing situation that's been getting worse and worse because as jurisdiction gets bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more difficult for the bench to maintain social control. So, as happens with many totalitarian governments that we have seen in our own recent Earth history. Uh, the first thing that a totalitarian government does when it starts to lose control of its uh, of its subject population is to increase the levels of uh, the uh, the severity and the extent of uh, attempts to impose social control. And for the bench, that is what has led to the increasing regimentation and uh, inflexibility of the system of uh, inquisition, which uh, uh, with its levels that are defined as what kind of damage you can do to who, depending on what they're accused of and so on and so forth. Well, as the system has become uh, more developed and inquisitors have become more and more, uh, um, have been granted more and more power, and there's more and more of them, and they're hated more and more, then you, you need a support staff that will be able to um, assist an inquisitor in torturing people. Because torturing people isn't... Um, it, it can be complicated, you know. It's not one person who's going to go into a room with one prisoner, physically subdue him, and then do terrible things to him. Uh, yeah, you got to know how to tie a lot of knots. Hey, we're gonna what we're gonna make a class of quirts to use and st- yes, anyway. <laughs> so we're gonna make a class of people who are big enough and strong enough to physically subdue people and to wrestle them around and and people that know the knots and that kind of stuff. And the issue there is that the uh, the ability to enjoy that kind of activity is not widely distributed uh, within human populations. It, it is. It is distributed. You know, it's a, I, I strongly consider Andre's um, uh, personal psychology, his psychological deficits, to be uh, to be one of the things that people just sometimes are wired for. But it's still a strictly minority sort of a, a situation. So you're not going to be able to find enough people uh, to really supply the increasing number of inquisitors with the increasing numbers of hands that are going to be required. Um, and so you, you turn to, a, to criminals, people who can be condemned uh, to serve as a torturer's um, support staff, uh, as punishment. That's how you rationalize it to yourself. This person is going to have to 
do these horrible things. It's part of their punishment for crimes against the bench. And hey, you know, if they serve out their term, if they survive 30 years, then we'll consider them to have paid their price to society and we'll return them to the civilian population and we'll give them all these perks and benefits and it'll be all good. But in the meantime, we need to make sure that this person is not going to suddenly decide in the middle of a torture session that he's going to kill the Inquisitor instead. That's the first first and foremost. And then we're going to um, need a way to make sure this person is going to do as they are told. So the bench has uh, initiated a program uh, several years ago of selecting people who are, A, probably guilty of a crime against the judicial order, uh, and, B, who are who have the degree of psychological resilience um, to be able to survive being being made uh, to torture people at a, an inquisitor's direction. And for 30 years of it, uh, they are, in fact, as, uh, as they are frequently described to themselves and to the world, as they are themselves instruments of torture. You know, there's not a lot of normal people who do that. So you take these people and you put a governor in their brains, and this governor is a, um, a, a semi-sentient uh, uh, cyborg type of an entity that is implanted with little filament whisper legs that will uh, invoke the pain centers of the brain, direct, stimulate the pain receptors or sensors in the brain directly um, in response to a certain set, set of hormonal triggers. And then you take those people with a governor in their brain and you subject them to ferocious uh, conditioning. Um, train them to a rigid standard of performance and punish them physically, painfully, when during the learning process they fail to come up to that system of performance. So people learn that if they've violated their discipline in any sense, then they're going to get it but good. Uh, so that if they at any time start to suspect in themselves a fault or failure, they are going to naturally expect to be punished but good. And that significant set of stress response hormones in a bond and voluntary's body is the one that tells the governor that, oh, that bond and voluntary has done something for which they must be punished, immediately, and all out of any proportion to uh, what, it, what it might have been that they had done. That is what it is like to be a bond and voluntary security slave. Um, but, and, and, comma, but, comma, the, uh, the payoff is that if they could only stay alive for enough time, the day will dawn, and the day is the day on which they, their bond has been fulfilled, uh, you get to go to deconditioning. They will remove your governor. They will teach you how to be a human being and not live in fear any longer, or they'll try. And then you get, you know, wonderful perks, you know, all the salary that they owe you for 30 years that you never got paid because you were property. You get that and interest, and you get your pension, and you get your medical insurance, and you get your benefits, and uh, policemen have to stand up when you enter the room, and all kinds of good stuff like that. Mm. Um, and that kind of uh, that kind of outcome is uh, turns up at several times in the series uh, in um, the novella jurisdiction. Uh, there is one of my favorite bond and voluntaries after the day has dawned for him uh, because of the act of prisoner of conscience, uh, so you get to meet Cadence as a free man. Uh, in the novel Hour of Judgment, uh, we meet a doctor of obstetrics, uh, strangely enough, who is a reborn man. And so some of that, you, know, you can see pieces of it here and there. Uh, yeah, you better hope you get to be. You, you get made a bond involuntary when you're young, though, because <laughs> yeah. you're not going to make it as an old man. Uh, and what happened to Robert shouldn't have happened to Robert, but Robert's turned out to be a man who can deal. Yeah. Well, um, so Andre is also, because he really cares about these guys and he understands what they're going through um, because he's he's 
come to know them um, and had to, uh, is he tries to keep them out of a situation that's going to make those governors go off, which is harder than it seems sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and a lot of the conflict has to do with, with, with Andre walking this line between, um, you know, keep these, these men who are forced to serve him to keep them from, um, just being in, in personal torture from the, the things that he is doing and that he kind of enjoys doing when he gets into it. Um, and that seems like more of uh, something that tugs on his conscience than anything that he does to the people he tortures. All he doesn't like it in uh, in retrospect. Um, he never really likes messing with the bond and volunteers, um, and they become you know the great friends to him that uh, have a lot to do with blood enemies, etc. Um, so let's talk about jurisdiction, the big novella at the center of. Uh, a fleet insurgent. Um, this is Andre's return to uh, what is it, Domit Prison? The Domit Prison, yeah. He's returned to Port, uh, Port Rudestal, where the action of Prisoner of Conscience, the second uh, jurisdiction novel, was placed. Um, at the end of that novel, um, Andre had upset the apple cart, kicked all the apples in different directions, um, and um, and put uh, put a stop, decisive stop to some uh, really, really ugly stuff that was happening at the Dolan Prison. And that means that at the end of Prisoner of Conscience, a couple of things are, are in, the, uh, in the timeline. Um, and one of them is that uh, Andre has said, okay, this guy is dirty, and I believe he's dirty, and I've got the evidence that he's dirty. And, uh, and so this is the deal. Either, either the bench decides he's dirty and he dies. Or the bench decides he's not dirty and I die. Well, the bench has decided that this character is administrator of the Dolmet prison is dirty. And uh, as a reward, quote unquote, for Andre's uh, behavior, uh, which uh, personally embarrassed the second judge, uh, one of the top judges uh, in jurisdiction, uh, as his reward, he gets to go back to, to Rubistal and execute a uh, what's called a 10th level command termination of administra Administrator Geltoy, which is supposed to be the most horrific death by torture that can be devised. And if there's anybody that can devise uh, an index case of the most horrific death a person can devise, it's going to be Andre. So uh, in jurisdiction, he's gone back to the Domit prison, uh, at the end of his term on Scylla. So Andre is between commands. He's about... Scylla's the first to... ship he was assigned to. Yes. And then so there comes Ragnarok, ship. which is the horror story. But anyway, yes. Yeah. So he's going from Scylla, where life was not so bad because his captain doesn't like Inquisition and minimize the number of times that he was forced to uh, uh, Andre to that duty. Um, and he's going into the Ragnarok, which is uh, just a, a really entirely different, uh, horrific situation. Uh, stopping over at Port Rudestal to take care of business that he's not looking for. And at the same time, since he is traveling uh, from one command to the next command, he's also trading off his uh, security teams. So he comes to Port Rudestal with his uh, security teams from Scylla, and he leaves Rudestal with uh, the security teams from the Ragnarok. Um, so another part of what uh, the novella jurisdiction is, is first contact story between Andre and the uh, security chief and crew, security troops, bond and voluntary security troops of the Ragnarok, with whom he will be spending uh, at least four and during the, comp the uh, uh, course, during the course of the series eight, and then during the continued course of the series, more or less the rest of his life, with uh, first contact between Andre and those people. Yeah, and this um, is where he meets Stildine, right, for the first time as well. That's right. He, that's where he meets Stildine for the first time, and Stildine uh, and Andre's relationship evolved into an extremely important one of uh, uh, support and comradeship. 
Um, and there were a couple little details in there that were just fun things. There was always an issue of uh, Jocelyn's knives. There are Andre's knives now and uh, things of that sort that are things that one always knew had to happen between here and there but never had a context in which to place those events. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the... I... I don't want to give too much away about the uh, the the story, but Andre does uh, manage up to come up with a pretty bad torture for the guy, right? He uh, psychologically. Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, it's uh, it's part of a plot point that started at the end of Exchange of Hostages when they let let him out of school before he had actually produced his final uh, final test, as it were. Um, and so what he does with Geltoy uh, uh, during the uh, novella proving, uh, no, excuse me, novella uh, jurisdiction uh, will become like the index case uh, that will be shown at Fleet Orientation Station Medical, the school for young torturers. If you ever really want to torture somebody, here's the Done. best way practices. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was, yeah. Andre's yeah. a creative guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and nobody, I mean, the, the Dome at Prison was a pretty much, you know, it was a horrible place that and then the guy richly deserved what he had coming. Or as Andre thinks of it, he more nearly deserves mm. what he gets yeah. than anybody that Andre uh, has uh, uh, come into contact in his official inquisitorial role. Andre still doesn't quite, it doesn't quite. Andre still does not believe that the punishment fits not even that crime. Yeah. If it was up to Andre, the punishment would be to take him out and shoot him. Uh, but he thinks of uh, Geltoy as more nearly deserving what he gets than anybody that Andre will ever, uh, will ever encounter. Yeah. And then uh, he gets assigned to the uh, Ragnarok, which is... Uh which is a very different uh, atmosphere. And, and the novella Quid Pro, Quo, Quid Pro Quo, that's his, uh, his, his, first, um, his first time on there. I mean, we don't see him show up in the novel. He's just there, right? I can't remember, actually. Well, the second half of the novella jurisdiction... Um, which is uh, separately shown in the uh, omnibus that we're doing, uh, Fleet Renegade. It's separately shown as a Port Buchane layover, right. originally bound as one. Uh, in Port Buchane layover, in that story, there's two things that I liked uh, and that I wanted to cover. One of them was, uh, here, is, here is an example of how Andre can game the system to get what he wants. In this case, he uh, wants to protect a, a person who is a wonderful candidate for the bond. He wants to uh, figure out a way to fix the system so that person is, is does not actually get picked up by the system in order to be put under bond. So um, I enjoyed uh, watching Andre or describing Andre playing the system to that extent. Uh, at the very end of the uh, that piece of the novella of Port Buchanan layover. Yeah, he arrives on board of the Ragnarok and has his first contact again with Captain Loudon, uh, and uh, tells himself that, that, gosh, okay, it's another ship. Four more years. Four more years, and he's out. He believes he'll be out in four more years. And, and really, how bad can it get? Uh, but the Ragnarok is its own special animal. It is not a ship of the line. It was never formally commissioned as a warship. It's an experimental test bed. And Captain Loudon is a person that would have been summarily fragged at the first opportunity had he been in an environment where that was even possible. Um, and so in, it, it, Captain Loudon likes to play uh, with bond involuntaries. He likes to torture them. Uh, he that's what he enjoys. He tor- he enjoys it in a much more immediate and visceral sense than Andre does. Um, he makes a lot of money off of uh, bootleg tapes, as it were, so to speak. And 
uh, the rule of life on board the Ragnarok, which kind of touches on it a little bit in the first part uh, of the fiction novella. The uh, the rule of life on board the Ragnarok uh, is uh, is ex- is horrific, and Andre has been hearing rumors that he has been trying to ignore because <coughs> with it. In quid pro quo, it's the first time that Andre has brought face to face in unequivocal circumstances with the fact that Loudon amuses himself torturing bond involuntaries. And Andre is trying to figure out what he's going to do about that. And in quid pro quo, he makes the first, but by no means the last, moral compromise. And he makes it in order to protect those bond involuntaries from being tortured for Loudon's amusement. Um, it's, it's not something that the Bonds themselves would have uh, necessarily appreciated because it involves Andre's uh, commitment to Captain Loudon to go further uh, with torture in the official inquisitorial system than Andre believes is necessary, required, or in any way justifiable. Uh, But Andre makes the bargain with Captain Loudon to gratify Captain Loudon's desire for uh, pain and suffering uh, inflicted on other people in exchange for Loudon keeping his hands off the bond involuntaries. Quid pro quo. And this process will lead to Andre becoming a bit of a, a dark legend in the galaxy as well, <laughs> um, if he's not already, that um, even other Inquisitors are kind of afraid of by the time we get to Blood Enemies, um, <clears throat> where it's used to, to some. So um, what are some other uh, high, some other points in the uh, in the collection? We, I mean, there's just no way to, cl- to cover it all in the time we have, but um, there's, there's some cool. What about the, uh, what's the one with the pizza in the title? Um, <laughs> Pizza and beer theater with your yeah. host, Cousin Samos. Yeah, and that that's a Things, uh, Stussy story. What is that one about? Uh, there there are two stories that I'd like to touch on briefly before we're done, and one of them definitely is Pizza and Beer Theater with Cousin Samos. And uh, it's called Pizza and Beer Theater because in the life of anybody who's dealing with any kind of story, let alone a story that uh, has got like um, a lot of novels in it. There, there's occasional silliness that turns up. And one of the traditional pieces of silliness for science fiction writers uh, is, as I understand it, to, uh, to place a character in, an, in different circumstances and see how people might react to a char- character totally out of context. In this case, the totally out of context is a malcontent uh, undercover, someplace where nobody even knows what a malcontent is, uh, let alone that he is a malcontent. So, um, so Stashi is sitting in a tavern having uh, learning about beer and pizza. Such stories are... The, the reason why in my house we call those stories pizza and beer stories is that those are stories that one might tell oneself or one's friends in a casual social environment like sitting around the table, drinking beer and eating pizza. But, uh, but the, they're not intended necessarily to be um, fully-fledged parts of the canon, except that the story here in the omnibus of Pizza and Beer 30 actually turned out to be strictly in the canon because it covers, it, it, it covers a pivotal point in the degeneration of Murgau Neukanner's relationship with her patron. Uh, but in the Pizza and Beer Theater story, I, I don't believe that I had written from Stashi's point of view. Uh, Stashi comes into the story, into the mainstream universe, in the novel Angel of Destruction. But uh, Stashi is, is not a, is an important character, but you don't read anything from his point of view in that novel. You don't see his mind operating except from, from the outside. And uh, Stashi's a cheerful guy, and I, I have fun with him. So I 
uh, picked up Pizza and Beer Theater partially as an excuse to write from Stashi's point of view, uh, available to me as he is narrating this story. And uh, Stashi and uh, Carol Vogel uh, form a relationship, uh, not that kind of relationship, a professional relationship in the novel Angel Destruction, and I wanted to watch that uh, kind of play. So that story was an opportunity to uh, put together Stashi and the bench specialists Jill Ivers and Carol Vogel uh, all first uh, messed up together with each other in Angel Destruction. And I, by that, I mean the introduction of Stashi was in that novel. Jill and Carol already knew each other. Uh, and, and just might have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, so I enjoyed Pizza and Beer Theater. Uh, it wasn't written um, with as serious an end in mind as, for instance, the Jurisdiction novella. But I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and so I thought that it actually deserved its place in the canon, especially with the information that it has to impart about uh, Morgana Canner and about the fact that um, having drunk black tea all of my life, I have recently started to drink a, a, Chinese, uh, a Chinese tea called uh, Pu'er. Mm. It's a special, its own different, uh, its own, its own different uh, species. No, excuse me its own different manner of, of uh, processing the tea plant leaves, uh, tea plant Camellia sinensis sinensis. Uh, and um, the kind of pu'er that I like best just kind of smells a little bit like lovely, rich earth. So, dirt rot, right tea. <laughs> um, but I'd also like to make a quick, a quick reference to the uh, short story in there called Intimacy. Uh, I enjoyed writing from the first person. I don't do it very often, but uh, that for that uh, first person narrative, I thought it was uh, a fun thing. For I, I enjoyed doing it. But the point of the short story intimacies is that Stildine has got a lot of uh, unfortunate characteristics, uh, but he has some redeeming qualities as well. And one of them is that he is a smart man. And uh, during the course of the years that he spends on Ragnarok with Andre Kosciusko, um, a number of interesting developments that he does not appreciate occur within his uh, within his uh, outlook on life. And the most important one is that he has become emotionally involved with Andre Kosciusko, and he's pretty much avoided being emotionally involved in anything for much of his life because of the background from which he comes. And becoming emotionally involved with Andre and uh, having the sexual passion that he has, uh, Stildine is a fundamentally uh, gay man. Um, and, and knowing, uh, after the subject came up for the first and last, almost last time, uh, in um, kind of indirectly at the end of the jurisdiction novella, knowing that Andre, uh, from his culture, Andre is not gay, and from his cultural background, it's, uh, it's an insult to suggest to him that he might uh, appreciate some of those behaviors uh, coming from Andre's parochial and rather homophobic uh, personal background. Uh, with those two things in mind, Stillbein has done his own sort of scientific investigation of what he's going to do with himself. And one of them is to uh, see whether or not a target would work. Uh, and he finds out that it doesn't really work, although uh, it's uh, interesting and enjoyable in its own way. Um, I hadn't had much of an opportunity to uh, explore the analytical side of Stildine's character, so I had a lot of fun with that short story, Intimacy. Hmm. <clears throat> Well, um, your comments about the tea that you like now was uh, reminded me that one thing I'd like uh, to say about the series that I just love is um, the richness of, of just the world, the descriptive, you know, like the the class on the clothing, or you describe them, the um, the <laughs> the folds of things. Everything feels sort of Baroque and sort of weirdly Renaissance fabric-y and... Uh, it's like this combination world where there's um, there's a rich aristocratic uh, um, sort of old-fashionedness 
to um, to a lot of it. That that's probably due to the fact that it's all a judiciary sort of system, and against this hard steel um, and uh, no nonsense um, destructiveness of of the spaceships and the jurisdiction and the wars and the fighting that they do, et cetera. Um, I don't know what you might want to say about that, but, um, but you know, I, I don't want to point that out because that's it's just uh, it's an immensely rich milieu to immerse yourself in. It, it reminds me a lot of of uh, Sharon Lee and Stephen Miller's Lee Aiden universe in that way as well, and Gene Wolfe's um, great writings uh, with his uh, Book of the New Sun books as well. It just has that feel. I don't know if any of that was was influential on you. If you like any of that. Um, I, I have to admit that I haven't read any of that. Um, so um, I, I did in, in my uh, in my earlier days. Um, I could make a blanket a, a, a blanket sweeping statement that everybody has read Tolkien, but at the same time that I was reading uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and so forth. Um, I was also reading other uh, wonderful fantasy writers like Lord Dunsany, and especially a gent named E. R. Edison, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote a book called The Worm of Roboros that's part of his uh, Fish Dinner in Nemesis uh, quadrology, yeah, yeah. or trilogy and a half, because I think he was dead halfway through. Um, and one of the things that I really loved about, and love, about E. R. Edison is that uh, is the... Um, the richness of his descriptions really helped me uh, be present in his story, so that I wouldn't be surprised if, if that kind of shaped um, in which I like to relate to my characters in my series. So uh, what, is, uh, what are you working on now, and uh, what's coming up in, uh, in, in your writing life? Uh, this novel is called Crimes Against Humanity. Um, it, is, it is the novel that considers a bunch of stuff. Uh, that's a technical term, bunch of stuff. Uh -huh. um, at, the, at the end of Blood Enemies, Andre was in a, a really completely different environment. Life had changed for the bond and voluntaries. They're not under bond anymore for instance, because Andre has removed their governors, a highly illegal process. Um, so uh, as the uh, eighth novel in a series, excuse me, yes, the eighth novel in a series that's been running for 20 years, there's a, there's a lot that has really come to a crisis point in Andre's life in Crimes Against Humanity. And not only Andre's life, but life for the jurisdiction itself. So, uh, uh, so on one hand, the different judiciaries are now going on in their own different directions, and some of those judiciaries think that Inquisition is a wonderful thing, and some of those judiciaries can't can't get rid of the system of inquiry and everybody that's involved with it soon enough. Um, and there are some unresolved challenges uh, that Andre carries all the way forward from uh, Exchange of Hostages, my debut novel. Uh, in Exchange of Hostages, the student to whom Jocelyn Curran was assigned immediately prior to Andre was a a horrible, horrible person who turns up briefly in the short story that is in this omnibus, the short story uh, in subordination, which gives some hints about what a horrible, horrible person that student was. Oh, he's um, who is that, Dr. Parfit or something like that? Yeah, yeah, Pafisk. <laughs> and if I had, I should have been more careful with that name because... It's it's misery to pronounce, and so in Crimes Against Humanity, it's just Daniel. That's his first name is Daniel. So in Crimes Against Humanity, uh, society as a whole is facing the question of what do you do with the people who were involved 
in a system that you, in this case, Hasperzak Judiciary and the third judge, uh, have determined were illegal or are illegal now. The third judge at Hasperzak is one of those people that just doesn't want to have anything to do with it. As far as she was concerned, uh, the entire system was a mistake from the beginning, and now in Hasperzak Judiciary, uh, there will be no inquisitors, there will be no more bond and voluntaries. All of the bond and voluntaries are there, we're going to cut them loose immediately. All of the inquisitors that are within the reach of Hasperzak Judiciary are immediately busted down to private e-zip, in a sense. Um, and the fundamental question there is, what do you do with all of those people who are involved in this uh, system of torture now that torture is illegal? It wasn't illegal when they did it. It's illegal now. Do you purge everybody that was ever involved with that system? If you do you're going to have serious uh, gaps in your infrastructure. Uh, and on a personal level, uh, that challenge is Andre meets this person that was so cruel to a man that he loves, uh, even though Jostler's been dead all of these years. Um, and on the one hand, circ- uh, gone beyond space where Andre is, is extremely resource challenged, and they need all the doctors they can get. On the other hand, um, if Administrator Geltoy in the novella jurisdiction is the man who most nearly deserved what Andre did to him, then surely uh, the man that tormented Jocelyn and has continued in his behavior uh, toward uh, bond and voluntaries ever since uh, he is the guy that is the second most nearly deserving character in Andre's uh, point of view uh, as anybody to whom Andre really wishes that he could do truly unspeakable things uh, and is constrained by the fact that uh, a lot of details that are in the context of the novel Crimes Against Humanity. So Crimes Against Humanity, in a sense, is um, is a sort of after-the-war sort of novel, uh, examining, among other things, what else has been going on in jurisdiction uh, while everybody's been distracted about the major problem of inquisition uh, and what impacts uh, things like uh, criminal cartels have in undefended, uh, undeveloped markets like Gombe on space, um, how Andre is going to be able to uh, react, uh, wrestle with, and resolve, in a sense, his issues with uh, this particular inquisitor. And um, at the same time, there's also uh, more mainstream issues that face Gone Beyond Space. Um, so I'm working on Crimes Against Humanity, and uh, and that's where I am now. I'm having fun. <laughs> Nasty stuff happens in it. <laughs> you, you seem to find every moral quandary you can for Andre to, to face, which is great. We love it. Um, so that's coming up. Can't wait for that. And out now at Booksellers Everywhere is Fleet Insurgent, um, which is volume three in our um, our reissue of, uh, and newly issue of Everything uh, Under Jurisdiction by Susan R. Matthews. Susan, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leiden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek and low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corval's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But reestablishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount armed attacks 
on others of Corville's traitors under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age and perhaps her very life is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. I hope you will do me the favor of failing to mention that little unpleasantness to mentor Barrick Jones, Inky said some time later, as they settled into the little freighter's bridge. Hazenthal looked at her. I don't understand, she said. Your actions made it possible for the mission to continue. You are to be commended. For a moment, there was silence, as Inky brought the pilot's board live. Then came a sidelong black glance and a rueful smile. I imagine that you don't understand, she said softly. Say that I would not diminish myself in the mentor's eyes. I had promised him this ship, and I had promised that my skill in persuasion was sufficient to gain it for the mission. That I failed so signally, she sighed, and the smile became wry. I feel that he would regard me less as a colleague, and as one who has graduated from his own institute, though many standards behind him, and I tell you frankly, pilot, I do not believe I could bear that. This Hazenthal understood. Who, after all, who would wish to seem a fool? And to lose Tolly's esteem would be a loss indeed. I will hold your secret as near as if it were my own, she promised. Inky looked at her fully then, black eyes wide. I can ask for nothing better, she said. Then briskly, please contact Terrigan, Pilot has, and let them know that we are, at last, on our way back to them. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and a podcast theme composer, Ruth Judkowitz, and a Get Out of the Inquisitor's Chamber free pass, and two dozen shares of premium stock sure to go up in value in Standard Buggy Whip and Bitcoin Company Incorporated, plus the thanks and praise of all of Gone Beyond Space for Susan R. Matthews, author of Fleet Insurgent. Please join us next year here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. 